Hello everyone, thank you so much for inviting me to do this brief presentation with you. I'll be exploring uh, some tip of the iceberg ideas really on inclusive assessments and especially setting them within the context of how this can help our undergraduates and postgraduate returners uh, to embed this within learning for life. For those who have met me yet, my name is David Evans and I'm Professor in Sexualities and Genders, Health and Wellbeing across in the School of Health Sciences. Um, if you're not on Twitter, and I know possibly we're going to be moving away from Twitter, but for those of you using Twitter, uh, especially now today, feel free to contact me on here. If you've got any questions or messages or any feedback from this session, feel free to contact me on Twitter. So, the whole notion of learning for life, of course I'm meaning this as a double entendre here, because it's learning enabling people throughout life, but also looking at it as a case of lifelong learning. Because the more that we can embed this into our students of today, the greater chance we've got that they'll carry on uh, um, thinking in these particular ways, especially across their life course, enabling them to be inclusive uh, um, citizens of tomorrow. And as Christopher Hayes says in his uh, concept of critical thinking, that actually embedding critical thinking in our learners of today will enable them to evolve positively right across their lifetime. So the more we do around these notions of inclusivity today, and especially the greater satisfaction and learning potential that our graduates have from their time with us, the more chance they're going to want to carry this on throughout their lives. So there are four key areas I'd like us to consider over these next few minutes. And the first one is EDI. Now, quite often when people refer to the concept of EDI, they usually mean equality, diversity and inclusion. But I'm sure you've come across uh, um, graphic images like the one on the screen here that says that sometimes we ought to be thinking not so much of equality as in equity, because uh, some people need that extra assistance in enabling them to feel included within the whole assessment regime of teaching and learning. So really important to consider the equity here. But also with the little steps shown on this uh, the, this diagram, maybe we ought to think of that as an individual toolbox so that each individual has their own resources, their own tools that they can draw on to make the most of their learning and assessment procedures. Because look how many people may have had um, maybe a poor start in life, or some have felt that they, they, they were often told at school, for example, you know, so-and-so could be doing better. So there are many people who are co coming into learning that sometimes have some negative learning experiences. And especially when we try to put them through uh, the, uh, the, the, the usual hoops of addressing uh, the traditional types of assignments that so many of us have experienced at university. So they seem to work well for some people and certainly not so well for others. So if we're talking about diversity and inclusion, it's going to be really important that we focus on this equitability as well. And I'll come back to the learner's voice in a moment, but I just want to explore some inclusivity even more. Because what we need to realise that if any of our learners feel um, disenfranchised for whatever reason around learning and assessment, or for those that might think, well, I don't set my goals high, you know, I just want to pass. Is there more to assessments than somebody just wanting a pass? But then, even when you look at what employers are expecting of our graduates, and especially when they say they want um, um, higher uh, um, classifications of degree, that may be great for those who aspire to go for firsts or two ones, but what about people who think, look, I just want the best that I can get to enable me to carry on in life as well as possible. So it might mean that we as education providers need to give our heads a bit of a wobble here and rethink the whole concept of what is it we want them to achieve by feeling included within um, um, assessments and achievements. 
And as Manveer Greval said on the screen here in front of you, we, we shouldn't be thinking of EDI as an end point in itself, an end goal in itself, but more as a tool to enable us to start recognising the power that feeds into all forms of oppressive structures. And that may be for individuals who have traditionally felt excluded from assignment achievement, and therefore maybe they even sort of um, uh, put themselves down whenever they're thinking about approaching assessments. So it's really important, and especially when we're thinking of people that come from uh, minority cultures, uh, mi uh, minority identities, and especially those who have felt marginalised, and for those who feel that their voice is rather hidden. Even when we're looking at big lecture halls, for example, look how sometimes there may be some students who are always the ones to respond to us. And quite often they may be seen as the enthusiastic ones, the keen learners. But what about all those who are quiet? What's happening with their voice? And what is it that they've got to say? So we need to realise that there's lots of different ways in which people, people can feel oppressed, and especially seeing that as an intersectionality of inequity. Now, I promised you a moment ago we'd look at uh, learners' voices, and I just want to give you two really good examples here of listening to the learner's voice. On one of my own modules called Promoting Sexual Health, uh, the, the summative assignment is actually to use Adobe Express and the students have to produce a, a health promotion resource in Adobe Express, so they're creating a web page, they must create images to go in it, and they must do some videos, uh, um, some real videos, and also some voiceover videos. So two that I want to tell you about. One of them was a student that lives with a stammer, and he's a nurse in the army, and he wanted to get uh, um, a health promotion page suitable for people who stammer in breaking down barriers to accessing sexual health services. The resource he created was absolutely stunning. And in fact, uh, it's the highest grade I've ever given on an assignment. He had 95%. And even the external examiner said that she'd never seen anything of this quality. So in enabling people who normally would have found it rather difficult, but here is something totally inspirational and something that this individual felt really passionate about. So making him feel inclusive in his particular style of assignment. The other one was another student, and one of the things that she kept saying to me, well, two things. One is that she's rather technophobic, so she was nervous of doing this type of assignment right at the beginning. But she also said that she hated the sound of her own voice. So the thought of making the voiceover video, she found quite challenging. And yet when she did it, it was her voice that spoke so beautifully to everyone that will listen to this resource. Um, and in fact, I didn't even have to say anything about this to the external examiner, but one of the comments she wrote in her uh, report was that the student's voice was the most powerful part of the whole message. So looking at ways of bringing people, especially those who are rather hidden or silent voices, enabling those to present to others. We've got to realise that when we promote equity, celebrate diversity and enable um, inclusion means that we're going to be unleashing learning from the straitjacket of identical assessments. So whether we look at typical assessments as essays, dissertations, uh, um, exam papers, we've got to start moving away from that and looking how we can embed the EDI right across it. And in doing that, we will be promoting and enabling learning. The second key area I'd like us to think about is compassionate assessment. And of course, some of the great names in, in writing on compassionate assessment would be Professor Sally Brown and Kay Samble, two really good names on compassionate assessments. But this one I've taken from Sally's presentation, which is available um, on her own website, and it was a presentation she did to the QAA in Scotland on assessments. And I just want you to pick out a few of the buzzwords here. Authentic, life-relevant, self-regulation, um, 
looking at process, not just outcome. Yeah, really important ones here, subject relevant and contextualised, especially even if you are using traditional assignments. Say, for example, if, if you, you, you're you setting um, essay titles, well, rather than setting the essay titles, why not just give a structure, a process by which people write essays, but allow them to choose the topic and negotiate with you, with you as the module leader or even negotiate it with their peers, bring in more peer discussion of this because the more creative they are and the more critically analytical as they think through the whole topics, less chance of plagiarism on the one hand, but also it means they're going to feel far more passionate about it because it's something that's relevant to them. So really important there. And also the flexibility that Sally talks about here. She says after those early days of COVID, and so many of our assessment techniques didn't work through COVID. Say, for example, exams in big exam halls. That all had to be scrapped for a while. So she's saying, well, so why should we go back to all of that? Here's a prime opportunity that we've got for really changing and developing for the future. The other area I'd like us to consider for a moment is around authentic assessments. So exploring what we mean by that. But especially across our schools of health, um, here at the University of Greenwich in human sciences and in health sciences. So many of our students are preparing for future lives in particular professions. So some of them might already be doing time in placements as part of their degree, or maybe they're doing visits or considering what type of field that they're actually going into. And therefore making assessments which actually reflect the real world that they're going into. So let me give you some examples here. Look how sometimes we might have a whole module on um, enabling our students to teach or to present or to mentor others. And then when it comes to the assessment, it might be the case that we ask them to write assessment on teaching methods. For goodness sake, why don't we just say, you've done a whole module on teaching, show us what you can do. Or supposing um, out in practice, maybe they're going to have to be writing reports. So for one of our assessments, why don't we incorporate the report and maybe a reflection on it? So we're bringing in the critical thinking, the academic side of it, on physically writing reports, but it's enabling them to do what they'll be doing in practice. So not just giving them skills for the future, but making sure that they can see the relevance of it. Because I'm sure um, I'm not alone in saying that students have said to me, well, that's the last essay I'll have, ever have to write. I won't be doing that again. So many of them see essays, exams, dissertations as something they did for a particular degree and they don't in anticipate in doing it again in the future. So we've got to make sure that our, our assessments are going to be relevant for them. And um, here's some th something that was written on a recent HEPI blog page talking about equipping students with a lifelong learning mindset. So it empowers them with the ability to manage and develop their career um, but by being far more useful for them in the long run, helping them to take their higher level thinking from graduate studies and apply that in their own workplace settings. There's that lifelong learning again. And the final area for us to look at here is to future proof inclusive assessments by enabling people around creative digital learning. Our university is just one of the ones that's, that's brought into this huge package called Adobe Creative Cloud. And there are loads and loads of different types of creative digital media that our students could be doing with the, uh, for their assignments. So moving away from our traditional notion of assessment and thinking, how can we embed more digital creativity into this? Because the more we do, the more we're enabling them for the future. It's like saying, um, even with some of our Moodle sites, for example, um, I've seen quite a lot right across the university, and I know some of them are, are, are what I would describe more as the old black and white television. 
But we've moved on from black and white televisions. So many people moved on to colour TVs. Now we've gone a step further and we've got smart TVs where we can access anything from banking to television, whatever, with the smart TVs. We can't go back to the old black and white stuff. And so many young people in schools today are actually learning digital skills in school but when they go off to university, they often find that they're sort of dumbing down on their digital creativity because the universities aren't keeping up with what they've been doing in school. And yet when they go out into the world of professional practice after leaving us, so many of them there will find that there are so many digital opportunities for them. And yet they didn't learn those at university. And especially when we've got some of our students telling us they feel rather technophobic. And in that case, they may feel excluded. Or some of them may actually say, well, look, uh, say, for example, some of your students in the School of Human Sciences who may be social workers and they turn around and say, well, we work with lots of old people who haven't even got smartphones. So how are they going to get messages out to those? How are they going to relate to those? But as time evolves, more and more smartphones will be coming in. So people are becoming more digitally enabled. So it's really important that we empower our students through their assessment techniques to be able to move on um, with digital creativity and the fun they get in learning as well. And especially when I've got students that turn around and say to me, oh, I didn't think learning could be this fun. Or um, some of them will create something digitally and I ask them to do a voluntary presentation on it. And they're all queuing up to do presentations on their assignments. Now, I don't get that when people are talking about their essays. So we've got to look at ways of including people and helping to celebrate. And this is the final area I'm coming to now. So when you think of our own um, Greenwich graduate attributes, which I've got as the three interlocking circles here. And if you haven't seen the document, please take a look at it. But as I read through that and looked through the graphics there, the one word that kept coming into my mind was empowerment. So I think it's going to be a super skill that you have got to be able to share with your, ins uh, with, with your uh, students to empower them. First of all, empowering them around compassionate, uh, learner enabling, authentic, creative, diverse and inclusive assessments. But also it's a motivation for them to learn and hopefully a motivation for you to teach as well. It also gives us the opportunity to make sure that we're promoting life authentic learning, enabling them to become broader academic citizens as they carry on with life, encouraging those who feel voiceless those who feel that they're, they're not heard or they don't expect to do well in traditional types of assessments. And it gives you a wonderful opportunity to revolutionise your teaching, learning and the assessments. So finally, to sum up here, a lovely expression I use with all of my students is what difference can you make? So after this brief presentation, what difference can you make? And I'd like to share with you a little quote from Teaching Backwards by Griffith and Burns. And they say, uh, it keeps popping up here. If your students can't learn the way you teach, you need to learn to teach the way they learn. Now, let's try adapting that into the whole arena of assessments. If our, if our students aren't doing terribly well with the traditional type of assessments that we do for them, how can we think of assessments that will be far more inclusive and meaningful to them that they're going to get far more out of it? Not necessarily in grades, but making sure that it's more suitable for their lives and for their lifelong learning. And this is going to draw in then all those people who feel um, disenfranchised and those for whom there is some sort of gap, whether that's based on ethnicities, uh, sexual orientations, genders, or even ages and different experience across life. It could be that we're dealing with older students, many of whom haven't studied for a few years, and the only memory they've got of their studying was the way they had to sit exams in the past. And it could be people from different parts of the world who have also learned very different types of learning techniques and assessments from those. 
So we've got to be able to draw all of these in and build on everyone. So think back to the equity sign at the beginning. And I said that one person was standing on a toolbox. Let's see what each individual has got within their own toolbox. And that's how they'll achieve it. So here we go then. Making assessments more inclusive means we need to celebrate equity, diversity and inclu inclusion and to be able to promote com uh, compassionate, authentic, digitally created, uh, creative and future proofed achievements. Okay, thank you all so much uh, for listening to this. I've prepared a page with references on there so if you want those you can scan in the QR code and feel free to contact me on Twitter at any time. Thank you so much for listening.